the risk for an investor not knowing about this, not mm -hmm. knowing a proper due diligence on what you can do or not do in a zone, uh, may have detrimental impact to your business. It's the biggest mistake is that people invest into a zoning area that may already be regulated against what they think they're going to do, which is an ROI, Airbnb or whatever. Yeah. I see people talking about green belt mm -hmm. and green zone and what's the difference. To me, a green zone or a green belt is fully protected. You cannot build anything. What I think we need now is enforcement or clarity spelled out by the government what you can and you cannot do in the different zones because Hello everyone, uh, welcome back with our business talk sessions and I'm Winnie, one of the legal staff in Seven Sons Indonesia. Hereby, I also present you our usual guest, uh, CEO of Seven Sons Indonesia, who will also be assisting us with our discussion today. And for today's topic, we are going to discuss about land zoning, especially in Bali. Uh, a lot of clients coming to us asking for a lot of tips in purchasing a property in Bali. The main question that they are usually asking uh, to us before purchasing a property is regarding a zone. What do you think like um, is like <coughs> land zoning in Bali? Because you have been living in Bali for years, right? Yeah, I think uh, you deal with them more than I do because yeah. it's your department. But but mm -hmm. I think it's it's right that. <coughs> It's one of the major major concerns and one of the major topics. And I think uh, in particular recently, it's become much more uh, relevant to talk about in the mm -hmm. sense that a few ministers of Djokovic's outgoing uh, uh, ministers, they have been talking about a possible moratorium, which uh, to me uh, doesn't, doesn't make sense. I think it's much more important to make sure that existing regulations are followed and then we'll have less issues. And I think that's what the moratorium will probably boil down to. Uh, but that's led to a dialogue on the different zonings. And mm -hmm. I think we, we released a blog uh, some weeks back on the same topic, in particular the uh, moratorium. But to me, again, that is back to the enforcement and what you can do and not do in the different zonings. And if you look at it, uh, all the regencies in Bali now will have what we call an arte arwe, so a zoning uh, regulation or maps of what you can do in each area. Uh, some of them, like Badung, is very easy to, to figure out because it's all online. We can do a real-time check, but the other uh, regencies may, may do that later. But still, all of that was passed uh, in the new uh, latest sign. Um, zoning regulation, October 2023, so about mm -hmm. a year ago. And I think there, first of all, we need to sort of look at what zonings that actually exist out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can look at then what is relevant for development and, and, and so on. But I think uh, in basic we have, because like you say, property and, and hospitality is the main mm -hmm. sort of drive or motivation for people to come to Bali and, and, and do business, regardless of that being villas or restaurants or whatever, it, it's somewhat related to tourism. So the main uh, zone for that is obviously what we call a tourism zone, which yeah. in most uh, regencies will be based around the coastline of mm -hmm. Bali. Uh, you then have uh, quite a bit of what we call or the government called mixed zones, which allow for tourism, it allows for residents, it allows for a lot of different things. And I think uh, in the lack of uh, clarity on the zoning law, some of these zones were already quite messy, so it was kind of mm -hmm. uh, translated then into a mixed zone. And then you have yellow zone, which a lot of people talk about, which is residential zone. Yeah. And then you have, uh, uh, and that will have different levels depending on density of uh, built that uh, is in that particular area. And then you'll have farming land that mm -hmm. uh, is non-rice field farming land, which in most regions is also will allow for some uh, type of built and some uh, footprint on in the sense that uh, you can build some, but probably not as much as in other zones. Uh, then there is <coughs> what we call LSD or still farming land, but related to rice fields, which is a food protection program from the government, central government. <coughs> and the last, I guess, is what we call green belts or totally green zones mm -hmm. that should stay green. Uh, that I think is the main sort of zones that are relevant for a client to be aware of. Yeah. 
so basically uh, a land zoning is like the um, the classification of land hmm. for its uh, designated use right but and uh, like have you been said before there are types of zone which uh, contains of uh, tourism zones and also residential zones mm. green belt zones and so on uh, mm. why do you think it is important for clients who wants to purchase a property in bali to know like the zone of the land they are going to purchase well i think it's tremendously important yeah. uh, because it defines very clearly uh, what you can do and not do, or what you should do and not do. Yeah. And I think that uh, until recently, it's kind of been, you can do whatever you want in whatever zone, which obviously is not mm -hmm. uh, correct. And I think the risk for an investor not knowing about this, not mm -hmm. knowing a proper due diligence on what you can do and not do in a zone, uh, may have detrimental impact mm -hmm. to your business. So like if you are looking at doing a Airbnb hospitality zoning, you would obviously choose to go in tourism zones. Some people then say, oh, I'll just buy in residential. Mm -hmm. But most residential zones actually do not allow for an Airbnb unless yeah. you're a local. So even a PMA in some residential zones, they can't actually buy the land, let alone get a bill permit. In some cases, they'll try to circumvent that with a lease on top of it and a relationship to, to the freehold owner, mm -hmm. which you could probably argue legally, but still at some stage, the new government now coming or next may say, no, we, we don't want to have any, any tourism or short-term rental in the residential zone. Uh, you can look at, for instance, farming that we, we talked about, farming land, non-rice uh, non field. <clears throat> that does allow for quite a bit of tourism activities, but probably more towards what we would call agro tourism, yeah. low density built, uh, uh, and sort of still caretaking, you know, the, the greener aspect of that. We even see people who come to us a bit too late and they've figured out that they own a villa in a green belt, which yeah. then you cannot get any permits, you cannot get any aspect and you actually have a threat of at some stage uh, facing uh, serious issues but to me the difference between and i see this in a lot of agencies saying oh it's yellow zone you can buy yellow zone you can buy yellow mm -hmm. zone you can lease to me that is the next sort of wave of issues that will come now where people are figuring out and we see it in particular in our pbg slf application where a pma figures out they can't get the permits so they have to circumvent then sometimes uh, agencies or consultants suggest to do a lease in the name of mm -hmm. someone local and they apply for the permit and then they terminate that lease and then the business comes back on. To me that is just a uh, extension of the problem and a real solid uh, legal framework need to be worked out where you know we tend to take those discussions to pay public bill because they are the one that that obviously issues the regulation and also mm -hmm. uh, governs the zoning maps. So PU is the one uh, we where we can check <clears throat> the zone? So the like for there's actually two, but but the main one to me is PU and, mm -hmm. and, and when we talk about Badung in particular, Badung when uh, yeah. they have the online map that is managed and maintained by PU. So that is an online real time uh, mm -hmm. what we call an ITR or zoning mm -hmm. check. You can just click on the location and it'll pop up what you can do and not do. For the other regions, you still have to go to PU, show the yeah. location. Mm -hmm. They may even have to do a site visit, uh, and then they will confirm what you can do and not do uh, in the land. But I think soon more and more of the regions will, will come back online with that. Yeah. BPN or the Agrarian Office can also uh, let you know, uh, in most cases, what you can do and not do uh, by visiting the, the BPN Agrarian Office. We have been talking about like uh, on the client sites. Right. So if you are going to talk uh, from the uh, government side, why do you think like the government needs to regulate a zone? Well, I think that relates back to maybe uh, one of the major challenges for Bali right now is, mm -hmm. is uh, a lack of infrastructure. So we don't have enough infrastructure to, mm -hmm. to receive the number of tourists that we do in particular, Badung possibly. Uh, smaller parts of Tabanan and Yanyar. Mm -hmm. To me, that is one aspect. Uh, and two, for the long-term planning, you need mm -hmm. to uh, regulate this so that you clearly know what's going to be a tourism zone for whatever reasons, what's going to be residential. And that <clears throat> has also some 
aspect of uh, protection towards locals in the sense that if you allow too much tourism into a residential mm -hmm. zone, that will push the prices up. And in the end, it will be difficult for the locals to be able to actually sustain themselves and mm -hmm. pay the rents or even afford the land uh, and be able to live in residential areas. And they'll be pushed further into maybe other areas, which then is farming land and so on. I think also the uh, food supply, rice, you know, all of these mm -hmm. things too, it needs to be structured. So that's why the government will have zoning regulations. And this is something that it's revised, you know, every five years. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, so possibly it's going to stay the way it is for 20 years, but I'm mm -hmm. sure there will be every five years, there'll be some adjustments and updates to the existing zoning map. Uh, so the regulation, uh, you think that the regulation needs to update mm -hmm. it like uh, uh, peri periodically? Yeah, I think I think uh, infrastructure is important mm -hmm. part of that. And, and that's what we said before that has kind of been lacking behind. So today mm -hmm. we see uh, a lot of traffic uh, in certain areas yeah. because there's just too much uh, of activity and too many tourists, too many uh, maybe, you know, nightclubs and other entertainment venues that yeah. just uh, the infrastructure can't, can't cope with. Um, but I think, yeah, that the government forward, what they really need to do is maybe not so much revise the existing uh, zoning map. They will mm -hmm. eventually and mm -hmm. uh, that will happen regularly. But what I think we need now is enforcement or clarity spelled out by the government what you can and you cannot do in the different zones because it's there, the regulation is there, and we see this a lot. We we talk about, you know, oh, a residential zone, you should consider yeah. how you structure that. If mm -hmm. you're going to do a daily rental, do you have a local partner, all of these things? Well, others may not care at all. So mm -hmm. that makes it difficult for us to argue uh, yeah. for a compliance with 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 the zoning map. So to me, that is, when we know the issue, this comes down to like, PU, they obviously issue build permits, they, they do the zoning, but they may not have sufficient staff to be able to actually go around and check. Uh, that is more down to Satpal Pepe, which is then the uh, Minister of Internal Affairs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Police slowly, slowly now is uh, starting to do checks. So that's good that they are more active uh, on, on that, that space. And I think that's what we need to see. It'll also then be easier for the government to structure tax collection from all of these businesses in the sense that they can focus on tourism zone, residential zones is clearly for residential. And in, in this uh, farming land zones, you may see some hybrids that you have agrovisata or some kind of uh, villa developments and so on. Okay, so uh, what do you think like the most common mistakes that uh, clients or people who wants to purchase property in Bali do regarding the zone of the property they are going to purchase? Well, I think we touched a little bit on it mm -hmm. al already in the sense that uh, a lot of agents and agencies and uh, many people will say, mm -hmm. oh, yellow zone or farming land, you can purchase this. Yeah. Uh, and in some cases, the transaction, if you're in a PMA, may mm -hmm. happen. And if it's a lease, for some reason, uh, not reason, but I think it's okay for a tourist or a private name to do a lease and then commercialize the property. To me, that is just uh, not right. But I think that is the biggest mistake is that people invest into a zoning area that may already be regulated against what they think they're going to do, which is an ROI, Airbnb or whatever. Yeah. And they're figuring that out after they've already uh, put down substantial amounts of money, mm -hmm. uh, buying the land, possibly also uh, including already a villa or an off-plan villa. Yeah. And I think forward, th these regulations will be enforced stronger and stronger. So that's my sort of main uh, topic to bring up with people. Make sure mm -hmm. you are aware of mm -hmm. what you can do right now, what you can not do, but technically maybe circumvent a little bit now, but forward. Mm -hmm the risk management of your investment, you need to be aware. So let's say you yeah. you do a, a villa that now you can somewhat figure out how to do an Airbnb mm -hmm. in a residential zone. <clears throat> Two years from now, three years from now, the government may say no. Then you can only at the best do a long-term rental or maybe reside in it. So, so then it, it, it's a different uh, aspect of your investment that you need to consider. Okay. Uh, talking about knowing the zone uh, after they put some amount of money to the person to the property they are going to purchase uh what do you think like 
the solution the solutions that you are going to give to that clients if they if turns out the zone that they are uh, the zone of the property they are going to purchase is not aligned with the business that they are going to do yeah i think then uh first of all when people have put a deposit then yeah. they would go in to do what we call a due diligence or yeah. they check what the zoning is you know is there any uh outstanding issues on the land, mortgage, and so mm -hmm. on, uh, which then will expose uh, several things. Uh, and if in particular we focus on the zoning, uh, when we do a due diligence, then it'll be stated what it is and what mm -hmm. you can actually do. So mm -hmm. the client will then be aware and they can make a transparent decision whether they yeah. want to continue with that uh, uh, you know, investment or uh, not, and back off and, and, and look for more viable land, depending again on what yeah. they're looking at to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think uh, we are going to uh, note the client that it is important to make a binding agreement first, like or we usually call it like offer mm -hmm. to purchase agreement before they uh, put uh, amount of money to the owner of the property. So we can do a due diligence and we can know the zone of the land first. So before they are going to purchase that property. Yeah, I agree with mm -hmm. you. I think that, that there are many good uh, agencies and many yeah. good notaries out there who do due diligence, mm -hmm. but there is also uh, quite a few, few who may not be that diligent. So you get a very simple due diligence that may yeah. not give you much mm -hmm. information. Uh, and you're entering into something that you don't fully know uh, mm -hmm. the impact of. We also see quite a lot of very simple uh, pre-agreements or like mm -hmm. we would call it an OTP, offer to purchase, yeah. which has those aspects in there. So they've already parted with 10% in some way mm -hmm. and then they get into a dispute whether that uh, due diligence is actually in accordance with what they expected. And because they then are worried about losing the 10%, they come up with the other 90% of the money to secure the property. But but to me, uh, it may be better than to actually take the battle to get that deposit return mm -hmm. uh, in order to not enter into a business uh, venture that is not in accordance with what you want it to be or expect it to be, yeah. Yes, so if we are do a check, uh, whether in the website or in the government itself, receive a result like uh, official result, which is uh, which is called ITR or Informasi Tata Ruang, mm -hmm. or in English we call it like special information. Yeah, yeah correct. That, like that. I think that that that's true. Yeah. So in our due diligence, we will include mm -hmm. that, and 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 you can get that uh, through a notary or many other yeah. uh, agencies. Uh, but that particular uh, printout, which will be an official document. Mm -hmm will govern uh, anything you can do on that land, not just the activity like yeah. we talked about. Can you do tourism activity, short term rental or, or is it just residential? Mm -hmm. But it will also govern uh, the footprint or the size of the land. So let's say you're buying a thousand square meters of land, you may be allowed to build only on half. Mm -hmm. It will also govern uh, height restrictions, so mm -hmm. anything from normally in Badung, in some regions is maybe less, but between 12 and 15 meters, so mm -hmm. three to four floors. And it'll regulate setbacks. Let's say there's a temple, mm -hmm. or in many cases, like what we see now is a hot topic is setback from the cliff, because there's been an awful lot of uh, cases, including the government itself on, on cut and field on the, on the cliff that has yeah. drawn uh, attention. So all of these will be spelled out in that in Indonesian mm -hmm. uh, as part of our due diligence, we would then translate that into English so people people mm -hmm. understand what, what it is. And actually our latest seminar with PU Badung, uh, he promised to actually also have an English version of the zoning map so that foreigners oh, can go in oh, and yeah. also do a real-time check. I think um, since last year, we often heard about Greenbelt or LSD, Lahan Sawah yang Dilindungi. What do you think is like, what do you think the LSD or the green belt is? Why do you think it is important for uh, expats to know and to aware of what is the green belt? Well, I think the what you're touching on is is the confusion, and yeah, I hear this yeah, too. I see people talking about green belt mm -hmm. and green zone, and what's the difference? To me, a green zone or a green belt is 
fully protected. You cannot build anything mm. uh, while a farming land or agriculture land in mm. some cases will allow for a low percentage built mm. and some kind of activity. LSD or the food protection of rice fields is absolutely not built at all. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's another misperception out there and some agencies says that oh, if you're in a green belt or a fully protected zone that you cannot build, you can do a non-permanent building. So like mm -hmm. a wooden structure or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not true. Any building, whether it's a wooden building uh, or a non-permanent building, will need a build permit and you cannot get it in a green belt. Mm -hmm. The only institution that talks about a non-permanent building mm -hmm. is the tax office because the depreciation of a non-permanent building is quicker than a permanent building built in you know, cement and whatever, yeah. and normal construction. Talking about uh, people who confuse regarding the zone, um, mm. the government itself usually, you know, like has different result on the zone, because we have uh, some cases which is like the BPN or the land agency said that <coughs> this land is in the yellow zone. However, if we are checking it, if we check it to the PU, they said like. It is on the protected rice field. So based on our experience and also for not also for the people who want to purchase the property and check the zone, um, if we are facing the different opinion on the government, uh, the person who will know about the uh, zone is the PU. You know, like uh, regulate about the zone Be more. Be the referee. So. Or yeah, the, the, something like yeah. that. So if the zone is different from its government, so the PO itself will tell the BPN or the land agency that this zone is already on the LSD or the green belt, something like that. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, we see maybe two aspects of that uh, when we talk about <coughs> different results from yeah. different institutions. And sometimes they are just overlap issues in the sense yeah. that uh, for whatever reason, they use different mm -hmm. technology and different maps. So as an example, uh, in what you bring up, you can have uh, one institution showing a tourism zone mm -hmm. while in the other institution it shows as a protected zone or, or green belt. And then you need to obviously do a further uh, investigation into that. Yeah. And what we would do in that case, we would actually ask PEU to come and verify and measure up and mm -hmm. issue, if need be, an official statement on what you can do or not so that you're ensured that you can actually uh, get a build permit. That's our discussion for today. To wrap up, it is worth nothing to check the property that you are going to purchase before you purchase it. Because if you are not check the zone of the land you are going to purchase, it will cost you more at the end. If you want further consultation regarding the property or regarding the zone, you can contact us at Seven Stones Indonesia. Thank you.